this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 through 11, is, I, I know I say this from time to time, it's a passage you could probably do two or three, just this passage, you could do two or three sermons on it, if not more, but the chapters are long in this book. And I want to read at the outset, I want to just read the entire thing briefly in the New Living, because I love the New Living. I love how it it gives you the thought for thought. It gives you the, how would I say this to somebody today versus um, New King James, NASB. Some of these um, uh, scriptures, the translations are more of a word for word, which is what we want, but I just think it it colors it. It's like when you watch a, a football game, you have a guy talking about what's going on and then a guy who talks about like, hey, this is what we did when we were playing that exact same thing. And so it kind of helps to have a play-by-play and a color. <clears throat> and I do think that um, the New Living colors it uh, pretty awesome. He says in verse one, now, uh, and now dear brothers and sisters, I will, I will write about the special abilities the Holy Spirit gives to each of us, for I must correct your misunderstandings about them. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. I want you to know how to discern what is truly from God. No one speaking by the Spirit of God can curse Jesus. No one is able to say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That's an interesting thing because you wouldn't think that people need to have somebody say that, but we do. Now, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but it is the same Holy Spirit who is the source of all of them. There are different kinds of service in the church but it is the same Lord we are serving. But our, uh, but it is the same Lord we are serving. There are different ways God works in our lives, but it is the same God who does the work through all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church. The one to one person, the Spirit gives all gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, gives the gift of special knowledge. The Spirit gives special faith to another. And someone else gives the, answer, gives the power to heal the sick. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and to another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to know whether it is really the Spirit of God or another spirit that is speaking. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, and another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So the gifts that we were given, that's the title of the message. Most people that I have come across like gifts. Most people like, and we would call them presents probably in our day. Um, when you walk up to somebody they haven't seen in a while, and maybe you're having coffee with them, or maybe you're having lunch with them, and you bring them something, generally they're like surprised and their eyes light up because it's like, Wow, you thought of me. You went out of your way and you ordered something on Amazon to your house. I'm just kidding. Most people, you know, when they give a gift, there's, there's some thought behind it. But it's rare when you meet somebody who doesn't like gifts or presents, but it does happen. Um, I've never met a kid that doesn't like gifts, um, presents. But this morning we're looking at the spiritual giftings and unfortunately the ignorance that plagues the church with this. It plagued the Corinthian church. And I think it largely, there there is an ignorance, not a hundred percent, but there is an ignorance with the gifts in our day and age. And I'm not a hundred percent sure why that's the case, but Paul corrects it in this passage. And he says in verses one and two, this is the new, uh, new King James. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were y- y- that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. The New Living said speechless. They're not dumb like how we would call somebody dumb, um, but unable to speak, unable to do much. However, you were let. There's so many examples in the New Testament church and beyond where you can look and you can say there's some ignorance here. There's somebody that that thinks something that's not true. <clears throat> and part of the reason is because of our past. Some in this church were into serious spiritual dark arts or uh, witchcraft or just idol worship in general, going and giving themselves to idols. Shannon and I were given, through somebody that she works with this week, we were given a YouTube link to a video 
where this guy from, I think it's Uganda, um, is talking to this interviewer who is from London, I believe, and they're talking about his life. And the long and short is that he was at a one or two days old, basically married off to Satan. Okay. So, I mean, it, 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 I would, it's three hours long. We talked about watching it uh, here in, in pieces at the church with the people because the, the commentary that goes on, what the interviewer asks, I mean, wouldn't you agree that an interviewer should be really good when you've got this much content, like what you ask and what you don't ask? And so it colors, it colors for us as Christians how serious the spiritual realm can be in countries that are that this is more of the the place people find themselves in. Uh, in America, you know, you don't have the. I asked the guy once. I think I told you guys this. Like, how come the demon possession is so much crazier in these like uh, West Africa, um, Louisiana, specifically New Orleans? And he goes, well. Satan is crafty, and so he's going to use what distracts people the most. And in West Africa, voodoo distracts people the most, and so they use it. That's what he uses. That's what his minions use. In America, distraction. In America, excess. In America, materialism. In America, sex, pornography, you name it. Like, Satan is 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 doing a great job for his side in this country. I don't know that he needs many other tools. But this is for, for, for sake of the, the video. This guy was talking about the amount of things he was involved in. I, I can't even, I can't give it another couple of minutes because it's just too much. But the long and short is he was basically into not only witchcraft, but into the occult, which is another thing we'll get into another time, probably in the next um, couple of, of, of uh, passages uh, after this week because it kind of pertains to it. But there's an ignorance about it in America. Um, people, there's, there's Christians in the church that think Christians can be demon possessed. There's Christians in the church who go, absolutely not. They're not in agreement. A lot of Christians are not in agreement about this. I don't believe that you ever see that. I don't believe you believe that you see a saved person being possessed by the devil ever in the new Testament. I don't think you ever see it. So I don't know where they get it, but they get it from somewhere. Can you be harassed? Can you be messed with? Can you be, um, influenced by outside, uh, sources? Absolutely. Can he be, can you be, you know, it's like uh, when someone says something to you and it rents space in your head for a little while, um, they'll say, um, you know, you like, I'll just use like golf. Like when I'm really struggling with golf and the guy that I play with like trash talks me all the time and he's like, dude, there's no chance you could possibly hit that shot. It starts to mess with me. I still have the same exact ability I used to have, but now I'm thinking maybe not, maybe I don't got it today. There is that we, we all struggle with that. But our pasts are a huge, huge stumbling block for a lot of us as to what activities you used to be in. People who used to mess with this type of stuff, Ouija boards, witchcraft, demon possession, they're affected very, very differently than certain other people. It's just the way it is. And so there's superstitions that some Christians still hang on to. They still believe. People that, that, that come out of that, that just get saved— they don't have any discipleship. They have no relationship. They have no longevity with the Lord. And so they don't really know much about God's word. And so they still think, ooh, a black cat ran out in front of me today. Seven years of bad luck. I heard that. I think I heard it on Bugs Bunny. Honestly, I don't know where it comes from. Um, the ladder and the this and that, broken mirrors. And it's like, where does this even come from? How many 13th floor, how many hotels don't have those? That's America. We don't stay on the 13th floor. I would, I would love it, especially if it was empty, where I don't have to listen to people. I'd love the 13th floor. It doesn't mean anything to me. I have no past with that. But he's saying, you guys, some of you guys are super ignorant, and it's because of your past. You were carried away by these useless idols, by these dumb idols, these idols that had no ability, but you put stock in them. You believed them. Verse 3, therefore, I, made, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the easiest cults, um, like if you're talking about just cults in general, when a cult comes to you and goes, Jesus isn't God, that's the first thing they say. You kind of wish they would because it's like cards on the table. I don't believe that you're, that Jesus Christ is deity. I don't believe that he's God. You're like, okay, well, we don't, we don't agree. And so basically what you're saying is you don't believe in Christ as, as the uh, son of God who died on a, on a 
cruel Roman cross for the sins of the world. You don't believe that. So, but then there's other ones who go, oh yeah, we're the same. And then you dig in and you dig in and you dig in and you find out under 18 layers, they don't believe that. But they throw out common vernacular. They throw out common words and you're like, I guess we're kind of on the same page. I know Christians that believe that LDS is Christianity. I know them. They say it. It's not Christianity. It's of Joseph Smith. You cannot tell me any Mormon will reject Joseph Smith. Not a real one. I've talked to so many of them, and that's a problem. It's a problem that Joseph Smith, who was a human being, who was born in New York, by the way, killed in Illinois, not even 300 years ago, is on par. You can't tell me that, but it takes a while to get there. And so I had Mormon missionaries at my house a few years back, and they told me um, that the Book of Mormon is on par, and it's the same thing. And I said, well, do you believe, let's go back, do you believe the King James Bible, which you have in your hand? Do you believe that that is the word of God? Yes. Well, then this right here should be accursed, according to Galatians chapter 1. Anybody speaking, verse 3, anybody speaking with the actual Holy Spirit will not call Jesus accursed. There's a huge conflict if you read that short book of Galatians with what they were telling me. And so I have to go back to the word of God and go, what does the word of God say? It says, if anybody comes to you and preaches another gospel, Joseph Smith, it's let that person be accursed. So it's not hard. It's just with our pasts and with our issues and with the things that we haven't really dealt with, we kind of sometimes buy in. We sometimes go, yeah, I guess they could be. There's a famous pastor um, who's everybody in the country knows who he is, who basically said, yeah, I don't, I don't think no, Mormons aren't going to heaven. I don't think they're not Christians. But on your website, you say the Bible is the only authority and so what you're, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. And as the pastor, that's a huge problem because you're the mouthpiece of the entire church. And so you're saying one thing when people read about you, and then they show up and you're saying another thing. That's a problem. Verse four, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Every commentator who's good on this book talks about four, five, and six, literally mentions the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right there. There's people who go, ah, the Bible doesn't talk about uh, God in three persons. The Bible doesn't talk about the Trinity. The Bible doesn't talk about um, the Holy Spirit and Jesus being on this. Yeah, it does. Right there. It says it in verse three and verse four, five, and six. So there's the, there is the hierarchy. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that that the diversities that you and I have as part of the church, as part of being Christians, is part of God. It's, it's God-enabled. You come to Christ and God gives you a gift. There's a lot of people who don't know what that is. They don't know what their gift is. They worry their whole lives about it. They're like, Where, I need to take a spiritual gifts test. I've seen these. They're all over the place. They're not necessarily bad, but they're not necessarily good either because they're not exhaustive. And Paul's not telling us that every single gift that the Spirit of God can manifest is in the written word. The list would be too long. But there's, there's, some, there's some gifts that we all know about, and he does mention them, and that's probably why they're, they're so popular. But in verses 4, 5, and 6, which is kind of, to me, like the bulk of this first 11 verses, there's diversity of gifts, there's diversity in ministry, and there's diversity of activities. And I'm just going to use yesterday, our trip to Mexico. I'm just going to use that as an example because a lot of you guys were there. Um, we took 20-something people there. So we had a job to do, okay? We have to uh, put bunk beds together. These are really high-end bunk beds that are uh, very heavy, very strong, and it's for an orphanage. And so the guy that's there probably has more work than he knows what to do with uh, to get to. And so last time we came, I think it was eight or nine people-ish, um, we had at least 20, probably over 20 yesterday. And so when 20 people show up to do the work of eight, it gets done in three seconds. You guys know this. Many hands make work light. So we're there for three hours and change. And I think we were done in less than two, if I remember correctly. And so there's a period of time that we allocated for these gifts. So some of you guys have the gift of painting. Like you, you're naturally a good painter. Um, I am not. Um, some of you guys are super strong and you're super, um, you're, you're handy with your hands and, and you're, you're tradesmen, Robert, 
um, you guys, you nailed that task in three seconds. Um, Jim Barnes, you know, Jim's, Jim's a, a guy who's worked with his hands. And I don't, I, I, and I don't just name, I just, everybody's on the same page. And I'm just throwing names out there because you guys know, a lot of you guys know, um, cause so many of you were there, but we're, 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 we're representing Christ. We're representing a church. We're going to another country, even though it's not that far, the culture is totally different. And we go there and we can't, most of us do not speak Spanish. Okay. I admit I should be able to, because I've been on um, five trips to countries where they speak Spanish and my, my Spanish is un poquito. Okay. Tops at the most. I don't even know if I said that right, but here's the deal. So there was bunk beds, which is like kind of the kind of work you don't want to give like a bunch of 10 year olds. Okay. There was painting some 10 year olds. You'd want to give that to as long as they were being managed. And then there was the, the craft, something that's more, a little bit more artistry than just, Hey, here's some steel bunk beds, put them together. Um, you also have, um, you also have kids running around on a Saturday, which they're not in school and they're looking for some old guy to play a ball with them. And so it didn't take me long. I think we got there and within three minutes I was playing soccer or basketball with a couple of kids that were like, Hey, let's go. Um, and I don't know what they said, but they said something like that. So there's diversities of gifts. There's di differences in ministry and there's differences in activity. There was 20 something people doing three, four, five different activities yesterday, but ministering. You don't have to um, be a guy who does uh, teaching or VBS or whatever to bless people by painting a 500 square foot room that's going to take one or two people like a couple days to do, if not more. It, it was done in three seconds. When that, I can tell you right now, last year, uh, 20 something guys from Calvary came over uh, with our guys and did parking lot and did paint and did, uh, they ripped the carpeting out of this place. And it was done so fast that people were just doing this. What are we doing next? What are we up to? I'm like, I don't know, but I'm so happy right now because I thought I was going to have to do that. I can tell you right now, without having a staff, we have no staff at this church. It is huge. Nobody yesterday said, I didn't get to paint. I didn't get to play basketball. I didn't get to do beads. Nobody said that because no one, everyone left their ego on the side and said, I'll do whatever I got to do. And I had to do the hard thing and, and play ball and, and throw balls and stuff. I had to do the hard thing. Honestly, I had to skateboard, okay? Because no one else was going to skateboard from, you, from this group. But I love what, what David Lowry says about this. He said, Paul had referred to God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit in verse 3. Now in reverse order, he stressed the unity of the Godhead. Get that. The unity of the Godhead. There's three in one. They are unified. There is no ego amongst them. They yield to one another. They have different roles. Unity of the Godhead in relation to the different spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit gives a diversity of gifts so that individuals can serve the Lord and his body, the church. The gifts are for the church. Now, of course, they're for people outside of the church too. But if there's, I, I'll tell you right now, yesterday was four hours of work, maybe, maybe less, uh, three hours. And it worked so seamlessly. It worked so great. I didn't see anybody crying on, oh, somebody took my paintbrush away. Or I didn't get to put that together. There was none of that. It was unbelievable. And I've been on mission trips where I have to just put out fires. That's all I do. And it was usually with high school kids. But 25, 35 high school kids and, and we're, it's just like, just putting out fires because somebody took my job. Somebody took my gift. Somebody talked to the girl I was looking at. I mean, it's it nonstop. And so it's, it's refreshing when you have a trip where it's like, I know it was quick, but it's a snapshot of what this is. It's a picture. It's a Polaroid of what this is talking about. He says, the Holy spirit gives a diversity of gifts so that individuals can serve God and his body, the church, in various ways, all empowered by God and exercised under his aegis. That word means the, pro the protection or the backing or the support. It's God's support. It's God, God backs you like an investor. God makes it possible for this to happen. Though there are different kinds of gifts, service and working, the same spirit, the same Lord Christ, and the same God are involved in all of them. Um, verse seven, the manifestation of spirit is given to each one 
for the profit of all. Manifestation, the making known of the Spirit. A Christian that's walking with the God they know without touching the Holy Spirit tangibly, like, like a piece of wood, they know it's real. They know it in their life. They know God's with them, and they know God's working. Um, it's, it's that, that word sometimes gets in the way. But once again, the Spirit's enabling, his making known of who he is, and his working is for the profit of all, all people, but the church for sure. Like, if all of us are working towards something, it encourages everybody. It, it's a wind in the sail of everybody. When it's working seamlessly, the problem is it's people. And people are troubled. People are sinful. People are prone to ego bruising. And, and oh, you hurt me. And th- that's just, it, that just never stops in this life, unfortunately. Verse 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to other to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, and another the working of miracles and another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of those tongues. That's a big deal. We don't have time to get into it. We will get into it. Um, but t- so much in there. What he's really talking about is you have to understand that this is the establishment of the church. It's not like it was one year old, but it wasn't 100 years old. And we're talking a couple of decades tops. Okay. And so he's talking to people far away from Jerusalem, far away from where, from where Peter in Acts chapter 2 preached the first sermon post Holy Spirit enabling, a spirit filled sermon by somebody other than Jesus Christ. So what you've got is a church that's, they come from, like, like a lot of us, they come from various backgrounds and various things they used to be into. And so they come together and without a lot of great teaching and with a lot, a lot of great resources, they're all over the board. At the Lord's Supper last week, some are hammered. Some are eating in front of the poor and going, sorry, you didn't bring anything. Is that very Christian? It is not. Is that very good? No, it is not. It's not good for anybody, let alone God's church. So these establishing gifts are almost offices. They're almost like, like the office of pastor, the office of bishop, the off, and, and we're talking, uh, we'll get into where these things stand today in a second, but these gifts in this church and in strong Christian churches were established by the Holy Spirit, and they needed to be respected. You don't just have somebody going, hey, I have my own interpretation of what the Spirit does. I think this. And somebody else goes, no, that's not biblical at all. But I see your point, so we'll adopt both. It's like, it's like marrying the world, or the, philosophy, the philosophies of the world and the church, and going, okay, we're going to accept everything the world says and everything the Bible says. I promise you, that church is dead. That church will go nowhere. Because you can't preach out of the one true word. Because you have to give place to somebody else who goes, well, I just kind of think that we're all on a journey. And however we get to the top of the hill is fine. And it's like, well, wait a second. What, what's true? Everything's true. Anything's true. Nothing's true. That messes with people. Wouldn't you agree the world is very, very off base? Wouldn't you agree the world is lost? that there's no one thing that unifies, the church must be unified. The church must be surrounded by the same spirit. So some have the gift of prophecy. Some have the gift of healing. Some have the gift of of evangelism. Some have the gift of pastor, teacher, elder, what, what have you. There's giftings. But make no mistake, when you came to Christ, if you came to Christ, the spirit gave you a gifting, period. You may not know what that is, but that's why you gotta continue on in your relationship because it'll be evident. And a lot of times, guys, it's evident in the rearview mirror. A lot of times you look back and you're like, wow, I've made a lot of mistakes. But it seems like whenever I went into that type of a ministry or whenever I did that, it just seemed like like the Spirit was like with me and people were like being blessed and it was like seamless. It was almost like somebody else was enabling me to do that. Yes, look at that. Don't look at down the road, the great Christian someday, I'm going to have all of these gifts in whenever I can get my life straight in five years or so. No, just settle in to your relationship with God, get to know the Lord, love the Lord, and the Lord will lead you to quote activities, ministries. Yesterday was an activity and 20 something different people 
all pitched in and it was wonderful. You guys ever played um, when you were little, um, the, the parachute thing, the big rainbow parachute, where there's a ball on top? Like if five people just, just stop doing it, the ball flies that way. It's not working. But when everybody works together, we used to do this at VBS, we could knock that ball into the stratosphere. And that's what it is. It's all hands on deck. Some of them were shorter than others. Some of them were younger than others. We played it with VBS kids. We had 10-year-olds, 4-year-olds, 6-year-olds, 14-year-olds, and a couple of 20-something-year-olds that were leading. And everybody was working together to go, we got to get that thing as high as possible. And so nobody was like, well, but I'm only like, I'm only like five. Just throw it up when we all go one, two, three. All hands on deck. That's what it was yesterday. That's a great little picture. So these are the gifts. And in verse 11, to kind of close it out, he says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individuality as he wills. There's individuality in gifts. There's your personality, your soul, not just your spirit, but your soul, your unique knit together personality that makes you you, that is, it's not only important, it's woven into what God has, is, is making you. When somebody talks to a certain person about Christ, sometimes there's not much, like they don't get very far. But then another person comes and talks to them and, and they, that, that person goes, I feel that you get me. And there's sharing that goes on. And it's like, hey, God uses people that are different. God uses diversity. He uses people from this place and this place and this country. And they're all different. And just to, to shoot back to this, this guy that we watched this video on, the, the, it's so much information. And he talks with a serious accent, so it's, it's, hard. Um, it's hard sometimes. There's certain words where I have to, like, even the subtitles get it wrong. Um, he does speak English, uh, but it's, Uga- it's a, with a Ugandan accent. And he's amazing. But the thing about him that's amazing is the evil, You got, I don't have enough time for the rest of our lives to talk about the evil this guy had seen prior to coming to Christ. The calm, the how he speaks, I have never seen anybody speak like this before. Now, from a great crazy past, oftentimes the deliverance of that is like, it's, it's a God thing. I mean, he would say it. He would say, it's, you just can't even, you can't even imagine what I saw. You can't even imagine the things I did. I mean, this guy made people blind when he was four years old, like in their little, little village in Africa, literally cast blindness on the people and it worked. Had a python snake wrapped around his body slash neck for a long time. I don't even know all the details. I don't remember all the details, but the point is that background to listen to that is like, it's crazy, it's entertaining, it's scary, it's amazing. It's like, it's so much. But he's like, it's it's God. God trumps darkness. I was in the darkest pit. I was like Satan's brother. And I was pulled out of it by God's Holy Spirit, by God's grace. He doesn't take credit for it. The stuff he's doing in Africa is like earth shattering ministry deliverance ministry and all this stuff, but he, he doesn't take any credit and it's not like he wants credit. And it's just like, you just see the light in the eyes. And you're like, from what you're saying, you were somebody so scary. I would have like traveled around you to not see you, to not run into you. That's how scary a person like that is with that kind of like access to the demonic realm. But the differing gifts, like what he has now, he wouldn't say that it's any better than the person who is an administrative helps person in the church. He wouldn't like, well, you know, you don't know. I'm, I'm up here. You're down here. It's not that. I want to get back to just briefly this idea of the differing gifts. Wisdom, the gift of wisdom, refers to the insight into doctrinal truth, being correct when you divide this word. Not taking liberties and, man, I think it means this. Knowledge is the ability to apply doctrinal truth to life. Faith is supernatural and it would be an unusual measure of trust in God beyond what most Christians would have. Healing, obviously, the ability to restore someone to health. Prophecy is declaring a message of God for his people. Ability to distinguish between spirits, very necessary. Discernment ministries are all over the board, but discernment is necessary. We need it so bad these days. It's discerning between someone that speaks the word of God versus a deceiver or a false prophet. Tongues is the ability to speak in an unlearned language. Interpretation, the ability to translate this in front of the congregation so people aren't 
Like, what's going on in here? I've been to churches where they just throw, everybody's speaking in tongues at once. No one's interpreting it. And I ran, literally ran. I was scared. I was a little kid and I was going to see a movie that they were showing, a Christian movie. And they just started, give each other a holy hug and a holy kiss. And they just all started going crazy in tongues. And I was like, I'm scared. If this is the spirit of God, I'm scared. I mean, I'm like not trying to say that I don't want to be a part of it. I just, if this is what it is, I'm scared. That is not the church for me. It met in a holiday inn, so I don't know if that means anything. Um, in a holodome. Um, translate this into a congregation. Very necessary to have a person interpreting tongues when tongues is being used. Very important. Um, tongues also edifies an individual in their own personal prayer life. Um, but to speak it on stage and people walk in and they're like, what is that? Somebody needs to be interpreting that if that's of the Spirit of God. That's what the Bible says. It's important to note that all of these things need to be done with self-control. Some churches that practice these things are not under control. And that's the problem. These are not only gifts, but a starting point in the early church. And that's Ephesians 4 talks about the same thing. But it's also important to note, and, and here I'm, I'm talking about other people. I'm not talking about me. It's important to note that many scholars believe that a lot of these gifts, not all, but a lot of the early church spiritual gifts were for the early church. I'm not saying me. I'm saying that's what a lot of scholars believe for the establishment and for the confirmation of the early church and were temporary. They went on for a period of time and there's a lot of very, very famous pastors and famous scholars and guys that have been writing for hundreds of years that believe that a lot of these things phased out after post-apostolic age, kind of a fade out. Um, I'm just saying, that's what they, a lot of people say. I do, I can see why a lot of people just randomly having the gift of healing, just you're healed, you're healed, just running around in a YouTube generation, why that would be a problem. I can, I can imagine that it's very possible that some of that, quote, power, might go to somebody's head in an era where cameras are literally everywhere. And you can put somebody on TikTok and you got a person that's clearly crippled that everybody can verify. And somebody goes, you're healed. And then the next thing, this person's healed and this person moves on. It's it. the Holy Spirit heals. Okay. So whether he uses a person or not, um, it's the Holy Spirit's power. It's the Holy Spirit backing that person. But whether or not we have the same amount of healers in the exact same way, I'm not so sure. I'm just saying, I'm not so sure. I'm not a person who says there's no way that any of these gifts are for today. Because clearly, we need people that have the gift of prophecy. We need people that can uh, discern when somebody's talking and they sound really, really, really great. But there's something amiss. We need that. But there are certain apostolic gifts that we see less of. We see less of men and women healing people publicly. There's a lot of fake stuff on YouTube too, but we see a lot less of that. And I would say that's an argument in the, in the direction for some of these gifts faded out um, after the full blown establishment of this covenant church coming out of Acts chapter two. Lastly, uh, verse uh, 11, which we already read, or um, I'm gonna read it again. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. It is his prerogative. It is the spirit of God's prerogative. God is so vast and so above humanity that no one knows why he distributes the way that he does. Nobody knows. You can't know the mind of God completely. You can know a little about God and you can have an awesome relationship with God. But you're, you're, his mind and our mind, not possible to comprehend, not possible to, to get up on that level. But let no one tell you that they have special knowledge and that they understand all of the workings of this concept. God is God and his prerogative is to give to whom he wishes, what he wants to give. One thing is for sure that when the church uses what the, what the spirit of God gives them, it is not only a beautiful thing, but we need more of it in our day. And a couple of, just a couple of quick closing thoughts. The first one is one of the weaknesses and I would even see one of the greatest weaknesses of this, of the church of Jesus Christ, the true one, is the ability to be offended. What, what crushes the church's progress, what, what crushes the advancement, if you will, in an old military where you have a front line and you have people behind that front line and the first gets taken out and the third gets taken out or whatever, what the weakness of the church in general is when the individual gift 
the people that have been given the gifts and that are using the gifts when they get offended. I'm not saying that this is an easy thing to not be offended. The world would love for you to be offended all day long. The world would love for you to just walk around offended. Just be offended at everything and everything, anything. But nothing can crush the well-oiled machine of Jesus Christ and his church working in concert like a few getting offended. Secondly, there is no better gift within the family of God. No one is better than another. No office is better than another. Humility is required by all of us and faith in God to know what is best for each and for the collective. We'll, we'll expand on that in the next few weeks. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for what your word says, that it is not our word, it is not the word of, of the philosophies that we've come up with. It is very simple. God, it's hard to always live it um, the way that we should in the days that we live in. And there are many distractors and there are many temptations. And we do struggle and we do stumble and fall. But we know, Lord, that there's an ability. We know that there is uh, power supplied through your Holy Spirit. Um, God, help us to be a praying church. Help us to be a serving church. Help us to be a loving church. Um, but God, help us to look uh, when, we, when we go off base or when we go astray. Help us to come back to this text and to realign with you and your Holy Spirit. And it's in his name we pray, Jesus. Amen.